Um, I just have to say how exciting it is to have an event with uh, Patricia Engel. It's uh, always, always one of the most exciting times at the bookstore when we can have one of our own uh, publish a book and present it to the world and uh, have us be a kind of kickoff for it. Um, I first saw Patricia in this book. She was at this thing that we call the Winter Institute. And it's where a bunch of booksellers come. And Patricia was there. And it was so heartening to see five, 600 booksellers get so excited about this book. Um, and I know that it's going to have a long, long, wonderful life. So congratulations, Patricia, on the book. Uh, and it's also, we're very much honored tonight to have a good friend of the store and a friend of literature everywhere. She directs the creative writing program at the University of, um, thank you, of Miami. Uh, and she's a novelist and a writer in her own right, published uh, widely. And her name is Evelina Galang. Please give her a warm, warm Books and Books welcome. One of the greatest perks of living in Miami is the access we have to some of the contemporary literature's leading international writers. As I said to the National Conference of the, Asian, uh, of the Association of Asian American Studies last week, Miami is so much more than clubs and bars and Miami Vice. All you have to do is sit still for one moment and listen. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of launching Patricia Engel's third book, the Veins of the Ocean. Patricia Engel is one of Miami's beloved writers, as Mitchell said. FIU claims her as one of their M MFA alumni, and I understand that your thesis advisor is here tonight. <laughs> UM claims her because she is in her cool and subtle way always inspiring many young writers as she has taught in our creative writing program. And Vona, Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation, the only multi multi-genre uh, creative writing workshop for writers of color, claims her as one of our familia. And I'm not going to lie, my kitty cats, Amado, Mahal, and girlfriend, call her Titi. <laughs> she is a generous spirit and a most talented writer and teacher. Just this week, one of her thesis undergrads wrote me and said, quote, she was an absolutely amazing mentor and made the process fulfilling and enjoyable. I have appreciated this journey like no other. Her novel, The Veins of the Ocean, is a journey of another kind. And in it, Reina Castillo takes us on a pilgrimage from Miami to the Keys, Cartagena, Havana, and back as she grieves the loss of her brother, Carlito. Patricia Engel's voice, one that Miami Herald's critic Ariel Gonzalez called lyrical in a no-nonsense sort of way, guides its readers fluidly between the present moment and its troubled past. Before I bring her up, let me tell you, Pat Patricia Engel is the author of Vida, a New York Times notable book of the year, and a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Fiction Award and Young Lions Award, the novel It's Not Love, It's Just Paris, winner of the International Latino Book Award, and she is the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2014 Fellowship in Literature from the National Endowment of the Arts. It is my great pleasure and honor to ask you to put your hands together for Patricia Engel. Thank you so much, Evelina. Evelina is a brilliant writer, but she's also a wonderful friend, and she, she gave me a home at the University of Miami, and I'm so grateful for that. And also, she mentioned that my, my uh, former professor, Lynn Barrett, is here, and she gave me my first home at Miami at FIU, so I'm very grateful for that, too. Um, and thank you to all for braving the rain for com and coming out tonight. I know everybody would prefer to stay home on a night like this, so I'm very grateful that you're all here. Uh, to celebrate the release of The Veins of the Ocean with me, this is the first event for the book. This is the kickoff. So, so 
It's a, it's a special night for me, and I, and I hope it will be for you, too. And thanks to Mitchell Kaplan, who is obviously, you know, one of Miami's finest. I was just telling him that I, I came back on Monday from Bogota, Colombia, where I was there for the, for the book fair, which is an enormous event where they get 20,000 people a day. And over there, people were talking about Mitchell Kaplan and the Miami book fair. And books and books, and it's known worldwide as a, as a haven for, for readers and book lovers and also for, for writers who just love to come here. So I'm so grateful to Mitchell and Books and Books and the whole Books and Books team who I've known for years and years and who make this place so special. Um, so this is uh, my book. This is the, the messy early version called The Galley. That's what it looks like now. Um, so I'm going to read to you from the beginning, and um, I think you'll see where it's headed. And then I thought I'd read something from a bit further on, and then afterwards we can, we can have a conversation if you like. Um, so here we go. You can all hear me all right, right? Okay. When he found out his wife was unfaithful, Hector Castillo told his son to get in the car because they were going fishing. It was after midnight, but this was nothing unusual. The Rickenbacker Bridge, suspended across Biscayne Bay, was full of night fishermen leaning on the railings, catching up on gossip over beer and fishing lines, avoiding going home to their wives. Except Hector didn't bring any fishing gear with him. He led his son, Carlito, who just turned three, by the hand to the concrete wall, picked him up by the waist, and held him so that the boy grinned and stretched his arms out like a bird, telling his papi he was flying, flying, and Hector said, Si, sí, Carlito, tienes alas. You have wings. Then Hector pushed little Carlito up into the air, spun him around, and the boy giggled, kicking his legs up and about, telling his father, higher, papi, higher, before Hector took a step back and with all his might hoisted the boy as high in the sky as he'd go, told him he loved him, and threw his son over the railing into the sea. Nobody could believe it. The night fishermen thought they were hallucinating, but one, a six-year-old Marielito, didn't hesitate and went in after Carlito, jumping feet first into the dark bay water while the other fishermen tackled Hector so that he couldn't run away. The police came, and when all was said and done, little Carlito only had a broken collarbone, and Cielo Soto, the fisherman who saved Carlito, developed a permanent crook in his back that made him look like a big fishing hook when he walked until he died 10 years later. Hector Castillo was supposed to spend the rest of his life in prison. You know the way these things go. But he killed himself right before the sentencing. Not by hanging himself from the cypress tree in the front yard like he'd always threatened, since that's the way his own father had chosen to depart this life. No, Hector used a razor purchased off some lifer in a neighboring unit, and when they found him, the floor of his cell was already covered in blood. But Carlito and I didn't hear about all that until much later. Since Carlito had no memory of the whole disaster, Mami fed us a story that our father died in Vietnam, which made no sense at all, because both Carlito and I were born years after B Vietnam, back in Colombia. But that was before we learned math and history, so it's no wonder she thought her story would stick. And forget about the fact that Hector was born cojo, with a dragging leg, and never would have been let into any army. In fact, the only clue we had about any of this mess was that Galito grew up so scared of water that Mami could only get him into the bathtub once a week if she was lucky. Which is why Galito had a rep for being the smelliest kid on the block, and some people say that's why he grew up to be such a bully. But when he was 14, Our tío Jaime decided it was time for Carlito to get drunk for the first time. But only Jaime got drunk, and he turned to Carlito over the folding car table on our back patio and said, Mijo, it's time you know the truth. Your father threw you off a bridge when you were three. He went on to say that Hector wouldn't have lost it if mommy hadn't been such a puta. And next thing you know, Carlito had our uncle pinned to the ground and smashed the beer bottle across his forehead. He was asking for it, I guess. Mommy had no choice but to tell Carlito and me the real story that same night. In a way, I always knew something like that had happened. 
It was the only way to explain why my older brother got such special treatment his whole life. Everyone's scared to demand that he go to school, that he study, that he have better manners, that he stop pushing me around. El pobrecito is what everyone called him, and I always wondered why. I was two years younger and nobody, and I mean nadie, paid me any mind. Which is why, when our mother told the story of our father trying to kill his son like we were people out of the Bible, part of me wished our papi had three thrown me off that bridge instead. All of this is to tell you how we became a prison family. It's funny how these things go. After Carlito went to jail, people started saying it was his inheritance, que lo llevaba en la sangre. And Dr. Joe, this prison shrink I know who specializes in murderers, told me that very often people seek to reenact the same crime that was inflicted upon them. I said that sounded a lot like fate, which I am strictly opposed to. Ever since this, bru this Bruja and Cayocho, a blue-haired Celia Cruz knockoff with a trail of customers waiting outside her shop door, told me no man was ever going to fall in love with me on account, on account of all the curses that have been placed on my slutty mother. What happened is that Carlito, when he was 22, heard that his Costa Rican girlfriend, Isabella, was sleeping with this insurance guy from Kendall. And that's it. Instead of just dumping her like a normal person would, he drove over to her house, kissed her sweet on the lips, told her he was taking her daughter by her high school boyfriend out to buy a new doll at the toy store. But instead, Carlito drove over to the Rickenbacker Bridge, and without a second's hesitation, he flung baby Shayna off into the water like she was yesterday's trash going into a landfill. But the sea wasn't flat and still like the day Carlito had gone in. Today, it was all white-capped waves from a tropical storm moving over Cuba. There were no fishermen on account of the choppy waters, just a couple of joggers making their way over the slope of the bridge. After Shana went in, Carlito either repented or thought better of his scheme and jumped in after the little girl, but the currents were strong and Shana was pulled under. Her tiny body is still somewhere down there, though somebody once told me that water is actually full of sharks, so let's be realistic here. When the cops showed up and dragged my brother out of the water, Carlito tried to play the whole thing off like it was one big, terrible accident. But there were witnesses and sports bras who lined up to testify that Carlito had tossed the child like a football into the angry Atlantic. If you, if you ask him now, He'll still say he didn't mean to do it. He was just showing the baby the water and she slipped out of his arms. You know how wiggly little kids are, Reina. Tu sabes. I'm the only one who listens because since they arrested him, Carlito's been in solitary confinement for his own protection. If there's one thing other inmates don't tolerate, it's a baby killer. This is Florida, where they're cool about putting people to death. After the Supreme Court banned capital punishment in the 70s, this state was the first to jump back into the execution business. I used to be one of those people saying, an eye for an eye, even when it came down to my own father who was already dead, God save his soul. But now that my brother's on death row, it's another story. Mommy doesn't go with me to see Carlito. She's over it. Not one of those mothers who will stand by her son till his dying day and profess his innocence. She says she did her best to make sure he grew up to be a decent man, and the day he snapped, it was clear the devil had taken over. Out of my hands, she says, smacking her palms together like there's dust on them. The last time the three of us were together was the day of the sentencing. I begged the judge for leniency, said my brother was young and could still be of use to society, even if he got life and was stuck banging out license plates for the rest of his days. But it wasn't enough. After she blew Carlito her last kiss goodbye, Mami began to cry and her tears continued all night as she knelt before the altar in her bedroom, candles lit among roses and coins offered to the saints in hopes of a softer sentence. I heard her cry all night, but when I tried to comfort her, Mami brushed me off as if I were the enemy and told me to leave her alone. The next morning she announced her tears had run out and Carlito was no longer her son.
Mommy's got a dentist boyfriend in Orlando who she spends most of her time with, leaving me in the Miami house alone, which wouldn't be so bad if I had any kind of life to fill this place. But I use up all my free time driving down US-1 to the South Glades Penitentiary. We're lucky Carlito got placed in a prison just a few hours drive south and not in the center of the state or up in the panhandle and that he gets weekly visitation rights, not monthly like most death row killers. I want to say you'd be surprised by the kind of people who go visit their relatives and lovers in jail, but really you wouldn't be surprised at all. It's just like you see on TV. Desperate, broken-toothed women in ugly clothes, or other ladies who dress up like streetwalkers to feel sexy among the inmates, and who are waiting for marriage proposals from their men in cuffs, even if they're in maximum security and the court has already marked them for life or death sentences. There are women who come with gangs of kids who crawl all over their daddies. And there are the teenagers and the grown-up kids who come and sit across the picnic tables bitter-lipped while their fathers try to apologize for being there. Then there are the sisters, like me, who show up because nobody else will. Our whole family, the same people who treated my brother like he was the baby Moses, all turned their back on Carlito when he went to the slammer. Not one soul has visited him besides me. Not an uncle, a tia, a primo, a friend, anybody. This is why I take visiting him so seriously and have spent just about every weekend down there for the past two years, sleeping at the South Glades Seaside Motel, which is really a trailer park full of people like me who became transients just to be close to their locked up sweethearts. So I'll stop there, that section. And I'll, <laughs> thanks. And um, I'll move you a little further along in the book. Um, so, Carlito's on death row. He dies. Not the way it's, it's you think. Um, so, so dealing uh, with his loss, um, Reina ha is forced to sort of become, you know, a uh, She's been devoted to Carlito all the time he's been in prison, so now she's got to make a life for her own. So she decides to move to the Florida Keys where nobody knows her or her family's last name and the crime that has implicated them. And while there, she meets a guy named Nesto, who's a very recently arrived uh, Cuban. And he's got a complicated past of his own, of his own and they're... Um, they sort of find companionship in one another and their stories merge um, in unexpected ways. So I'm going to read you a little bit about him because he figures um, strongly in the novel. And, um, and this is a bit about Cuba and I did a lot of research there for this book. So this part's fun for me. I hope you like it too. I also wanted to say something that I'm, I'm, so, I'm so touched to see so many of Miami's uh, artists here tonight. And these are people I feel so honored to, to consider my friends, um, as well as people who, uh, who are heroes and whose work I admire so much, uh, writers and artists and poets. And, and um, you guys all know who you are. But I have to say that moving to Miami 12 years ago was just a jolt to my creative spirit and my, my writing life took off here and it's in part, you know, being part of such a dynamic community. So thank you to all of you. So, this is Nesto. Nesto left Cuba three years ago, but he tells me he'd been trying to get off the island long before that. Like so many, he says, he was just trying to find a way. As a boy, he'd dive with the other kids from the rocks below the malecon, practicing holding their breaths underwater, counting the seconds, the minutes that passed, timing each other, seeing how deep each could go, vowing one day they'd be brave enough to swim to La Yuma on the other side of the straits. But life passes quickly, he tells me, even when the days are all the same, especially when the days are all the same. One day, he was already a man, sitting on the same seawall, watching the younger boys launch themselves from the rocks below as he'd done, taking in the ocean, that slippery surf, thinking of those who died trying to cross, many of whom were the parents, uncles, brothers, and friends of people he knew, who left the island full of hope, yet never made it across the water. 
His generation had been raised on horror stories of how bad it was in other countries, how the world, particularly Yankees, hated Cubans, and if they were to leave and actually make it to a foreign land, they'd only suffer and starve and beg to come back. But by then, their assets would have been seized, their identities erased, and in Cuba, the land they'd forsaken, they would no longer exist. Through the whispers of Radio Bemba, they heard when bodies washed up on the beaches, bodies of those who tried to get away and failed, and the people who would drift for days in the open sea and touch land, only to realize the serpentine current had played with them, taking them far out only to deposit them on another part of the island. They'd heard how the fattest sharks in the world are the ones swimming between their island and the Florida shores. Havana Cemetery is not the Cementerio Colon, he told me. Its real necropolis is the ocean floor, covered with the bones of those who went to rest with Olokun, Orisha of the deep. Even so, when the rods and planks of broken balsa smashed against the rocks or turned up on the sand, and even though getting caught trying to leave could get you a year in prison, it wouldn't be long before someone picked up the scraps of those broken rafts and used them to build another. Nesta was a good swimmer, with strong limbs and large lungs. He knew about tides and currents and could read clouds and winds as easily as the alphabet on the balsa. A ride on a ferry boat ferrying people across the Florida Straits would have cost an impossible 10,000 US dollars in a peso economy, and he didn't have anyone abroad who could pay it for him. Even if granted an exit permit, a legitimate visa through the US interest section took years to process through weightless and bureaucratic delays. The rumor was the 20,000 visa quota was more likely filled by white Cubans rather than Afro-Cubans, and the only way to move ahead in the line was through bribes. As we say over there in Cuba, Nesto says, one has to wait in line even to die. Even with the long-gone relatives in Miami filing the paperwork for him on the other side, Nesto knew that boys like him, healthy, strong, were rarely given permission to leave, too obvious a risk for immigration, and the aging revolution needed its youth. He played basketball almost every day on the unpaved, rock-pitted court a few streets from his family's house in Buena Vista, shooting at a backboard with no hoop, one day, the priest from the church where Nesto sometimes went for English classes came looking for him. He told Nesto the church's basketball team had been invited to play in an interdiocese tournament in Mexico City. Nesto understood what the priest was offering. He played the match in Mexico City, helped the church team win, and defected the night of their victory, thanking and saying goodbye to the priest who also showed Nesto the way to sneak out of the dormitory. He slept on church steps and park benches until he made his way to Matamoros, where he walked across the border to Brownsville, identifying himself as Cuban at the customs office, and was given asylum. From there, he busted to Miami, where his father's eldest brother, who had fled in the 60s, waited for him at the station, took him to buy clothes, showed him around, and helped him find a job. He made some friends, guys who taught him how to open a bank account and write a check, taught him about credit cards and car payments, insurance and how to use the internet, things he never had to think about back home. They were guys he would play basketball with on Saturdays at Jose Marti Park, who spoke the same chavacaneria spoken back home, who took him to see bands perform at Cuban clubs, who introduced them to their sisters and other girls, also from La Habana, some recently arrived, some who came as children. He was supposed to be in exile now, but didn't feel like one. Maybe, he says, because he left the greatest pieces of himself back home. There were things he liked about Miami, the quimbe and cambalache, the way things could be bartered and traded in daily negocios just as they were back in Havana, a stand-in economy of exchanges and favors, and anything else could be found at the local pulguero. But there was much that shocked him, the abundance of electricity, the entire city lit up through the night where the government doesn't cut the power with no warning, the excess of American supermarkets, so much of everything, so much going to waste. 
Sometimes he ran into people from home who'd crossed over before him, already settled with new houses and new families, who seemed so content with their lives over here that they didn't give much thought anymore to all they'd left behind. Miami was just as described back home, Cuba con Coca-Cola. He liked the sight of fresh paint on buildings and homes, how it seemed there was a factory fresh car for every person to drive on the smooth paved roads of Miami, lined with palms and working street lights. Everything so new, it was as if the whole city came out of a box. Even if the beaches were not as beautiful as back home, there were neighborhoods that reminded him of da da da, a fabricated seaside community where primary school kids were taken for an enchanted 15 days a year, unaware that the residences they stayed in would eventually house the kids who came to Cuba to heal from Chernobyl. And children like Nesto, who played in the fields and bathed in the surf, would age into the adolescents who had to work for their education out in the campo. There were neighborhoods in Miami lined with imitation Italian and Spanish villas, almost as grand as the palaces lining Quinta Avenida around Velado, spread through Miramar and Sibonet. If he closed his eyes, he could almost convince himself the air was the same on the continent as it blew in off the Atlantic, but he missed the ruffle of the tropical trade winds and the thick, salty mist wafting in from the Straits and from the Caribbean. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks for listening. So I don't know if, you, I mean, I guess I'm supposed to ask if you have questions or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no? OK. Yeah, Christina. That was so accurate. Christina's Cuban. Oh, God. That was so beautifully done. So how did you research that? Um, while writing this book, I went to Cuba eight times. So I spent a lot of time there. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It started because I, I met somebody who was me recently arrived here and he told me stories that were unlike any I'd ever heard before. And this is, you know, I, I grew up with Cubans. I've known Cubans all, all my life and these were still things that, that were quite shocking to me. And so that sort of generated my curiosity and I, I didn't know what, what, what that was going to lead. I'm just, you know, a curious person and I like traveling and learning about civilization and its discontents. Um, so I went sort of just to explore and, and realized there was so much more to learn and I just kept going and going as my story was progressing because it was really important to me to sort of get things right precisely for people like you who know, you know. Um, so that's, that's always what's important to me when I'm writing about any place is that the people that know a place could, could say exactly that, you know, that that you got it right. Cause I know what it's like to feel written about and feel like the person got it wrong, you know? So thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to stand up here when you're like not asking me anything. So. <laughs> Chioma, former student of mine. <laughs> Yeah. Researching penitentiary is always a good time. Um, um, yeah, this sort of my research always begins with some sort of original in personal interest. Um, you know, I, I've known people uh, who've been uh, affected by the incarceration system in different ways, including people close to me. So there's a lot that I knew already. But of course, the Florida penitentiary system is its, is its own beast. And there was a lot to learn. So a lot of it, and a lot of research just comes from reading testimonies of um, people who've been incarcerated, people who are still incarcerated. In this case, I was writing a lot about death row, so it's, it's learning a lot about life on death row, the people who love people who are on death row, what their lives become like. Um, and it's... Uh, it's a lot of also just like putting you know your ear to the ground and and I, I feel like once you sort of are you're open to research things start to come to you in a way.
Yeah. My question, there are two questions. Mm -hmm. I, I am curious about the name of the book, I, I uh -huh. love it. And then the second one is, how did you got the inspiration of the story of Carlitos? Very dark and very... Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. The story of Carlito came from, I was in the car with my mother, who's here, and my, we were driving near a bridge. My mom said, oh, you know, see that bridge over there? Some guy threw a baby off of it once. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she had no other information whatsoever. <laughs> And like who or what, when or, or anything, and but that stayed with me for years. And I thought I'll write about it one day, but I had no idea when or how or what. So um, I thought, how am I, how, like, from whose point of view am I going to get into that story? Eventually, I came up with the sister of the child who'd been thrown off uh, the bridge, and then I wanted to sort of look into how the ramifications of one act and how that affects an, a family. And of course, you can't, you can't sort of trace any single family trauma to one thing. It just goes back and back. So that, I want to study a family you know, through um, many decades and generations of, of, their, of their struggle. Um, and so the title actually came, um, you kind of figure it out in the book. It comes from two, two, um, two um, Yoruba Patakis. Um, which are revealed in the book, which one is that um, no one, then they're, they're placed next to each other um, in the Dilogun. So one is that no one knows what lies at the bottom of the sea, and the other is blood, th blood that flows through veins. So from those two, I came up with the title. Yes, Jeff. I understand that you're recording the audio clip? Yeah, I recorded it. You did. I did. It's cool. Am I here? Yeah. Um, so the, for the first time, I recorded the audio book. My other books, other people did them. This time, I decided to try it myself. Um, and it was challenging. It was really challenging. It took about uh, like uh, 30 recorded hours over five days, maybe 35 recorded hours of me just sitting there reading the book. And until you mess up, and then you got to do it over, and uh, it's it's tricky. And I haven't heard it yet. I hope it turns out well. But but I, I was happy to do it because of course um, Raina's voice is a voice that came through me. So I really felt like I, I wanted to sort of do her justice in the recording. Did you gain any new insights? It is really hard. That is the primary insight, and I have friends here who've done who've done uh, their own audiobooks, and they didn't, don't, didn't tell me how hard it was. Uh, yeah, I know that's probably why I, Evelina did hers, and it is really hard. And people who do that for a living, I have a lot of respect for them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ron, you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh -huh. we, we hear a lot about Cuba. We hear a lot about Miami, and you know, obviously the reference, the, the, the geography, and places uh -huh. that are that they know what's taking place in both places. But your the color has three particular colors, which are the Colombian flag, which is your background. Is is there any mm -hmm. tie on the story to? Columbia, yeah, like part of the the novel moves. It's, it's sort of the story's in motion. It begins in Miami, goes further south to the Florida Keys, and uh, you know through Nesso's story, um, flashes to to Cuba, and then the actual story goes to Cartagena, Colombia, and to Havana, and then back. So it is kind of like a little you know trip around the Caribbean, uh, in in a lot of, in a lot of ways, and. Um, yeah, it's um, so. I think what you're getting at is that these are the co the colors of the Colombian flag, uh, and that was kind of a happy accident. But of course, there are no accidents, right? But as you can see on the early version, it was greener. Um, so um, we we did we did work on it a bit because you know the ocean figures prominently, and, and it was Im important to me that there is a strong sense of blue, blue there on the cover. You had next. Um, your third book seems more the departure from the first two books that you wrote. Mm -hmm. They seemed more personal and more about the relationship that a woman has with other women or mm -hmm. also with a man. Um, was it a departure and in what ways? Was it? Uh, I think when you're writing a book, everything is personal. 
Um, so actually, this, this book probably, for me, feels the most personal in the sense that this book took four years of my life. It totally took over my life. My life changed as a result. You, know, you can't do what I did in terms of research and throw myself into the material and not have it affect you in a really deep way. So those were books that were personal at the time, but of course I wrote them then. And, I, and I, I wrote this more recently. So um, it, is, it, is, you know, it is still personal in a different way. And if you read my other books, you'll, you'll probably feel it. This, this, you'll feel it's, it's still me behind it. <laughs> I see I'm holding the picture. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. 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 I know there, there are a lot of your writing students in, in the house, and um, and there is like a difference between writing, um, I guess, in the process of writing that first book, Vida, and then the second, and then the third, and I just yeah. wondered if you could talk a little bit about how your process may have changed, just the process of writing and revision throughout. Um, hmm. I still, I still have certain habits that have not changed in the sense that I edit as I go. It's really hard for me to move forward, feeling like I'm, I'm on like a wobbly, shaky, mushy foundation of, of a story or of a chapter. Um, but I mean, just in sheer length, this is a much bigger book than my other books. So the stamina has, uh, has had to you know, improve. I've had to work on that. Um, I think um, there is a sense when I wrote my first book, for example, I never knew anybody would read it. And I think that's a sensation that I'll never have again, or maybe I will. Who knows? <laughs> uh, you know. But like, you know, I was really—I just wrote that book for fun. You know, I just wrote that book for myself, really. And I think, in a way, you can, you can you can sense that in the book. It's like, you know, I really wrote it for myself. Um, and my second book was also, you know, I, I just I had the goal of just writing a realistic love story. Um, and this book was like a wild animal. You know, I didn't know what it was for a long time, and it was just a process of like tame, trying to tame the book, and then I just gave up and let the book just be what it wants to be. So maybe that's the difference: is just letting go and letting you know a book sort of dictate its own needs from book to book, and it changes book to book. Yeah. Do you start with an outline? Do you know where you're going, or you just go? Um, it sounds kind of strange, but I, I'd probably do like a year of daydreaming before I write anything, where I can like see the book in my mind. And if I outline, it's very, very loose, just like sketches and notes. It's not something, you know, rigid. Um, and it's just sort of like little reminders to myself just to like nudge me along the way. But a book, a book for me, a book changes constantly. Um, so, but until I feel like the book, ha I've already internalized the book to a certain to a certain extent. I don't even try to write it because many times in the past I've just started too soon. I get to 50 pages and I just hit a wall, and it, the book dies on me. So I wait until I have a much clearer, clearer understanding of the book, even if it's just like an emotional understanding of of the journey of the book. Yes. Uh, where you live, um, <laughs> 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 okay. And you seem very young to me, but very mature. Oh, that's so nice. You said I seem very young. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I live here in Miami now, but I'm not from Miami. I didn't grow up here. I grew up in New Jersey, and I went to college at NYU and lived in Manhattan for many years before I moved here. And um, I've been here 12 years now. Very happy to make Miami my home now. Um, I, I started writing as soon as I knew how, but um, just little stories. Like I said, the way I wrote my first book, I wrote to keep myself company, you know, um, just for fun and, and my own entertainment. I never showed my stories to anybody, probably until I published my first book, more or less around that time. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, that, that was really it. I always felt like this kind of haunting desire, like I think all writers do, like the need to write. But I also had no idea how you go about becoming a professional writer. So I always had other jobs and would write on my own time until I um, finally 
learned about grad graduate schools, which I wasn't even aware of for a long time. And, um, and from there, I started to learn more and see what opportunities were available and, and write more seriously. And, and that's how it happened. But, but I was a late bloomer in writing, in terms of uh, you know, writing professionally. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> huh? You make enough money. So I make enough money. <laughs> this is kind of that's kind of personal for this forum. Um, but huh? Yeah, I make money as long as people buy books, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. That's a really good question. That's true. I meet a lot of people. I, I do meet a lot of people. And I have fascinating friends, and their lives would make better books than any of the ones I've written. But I don't write about them, and I think they pr they appreciate that. Um, but um, I don't know. Usually, usually it's there's something. Uh, there maybe I don't know. I I could tell you. I could make up stuff. Maybe if I had to say, it's when I I meet people that sort of like there there's a hunger about them or like un unrecognized terrain things I haven't sort of explored in myself but I see it in them before I see it in myself and that makes me curious and makes me want to just like go deeper um, but I'm, I'm also um, curious about you know people's connection to different places and things like that and and how people come together across different different frontiers and lines so I don't know that's a good question I'm gonna have to think about that but but you know, I'm still looking for my next story. So, still waiting for the next person who's going to just show up and be like, here it is. You know? <laughs> We're done? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Patricia Angle, let's give her another big hand. We know you're going off on tour, so we wish you the best of luck as you traverse the country, and good luck with the book. I know you won't need much of it, but it's such a wonderful book. You should all now get up and go to either of the two registers, and you should buy at least one. Um, and we have Patricia's other books there as well, and she'll be sitting here and signing copies of the book, too. So thank you all for coming. And by the way, this Friday night, we also have John Dufresne coming here from FAO, he'll be, he'll be here at eight o'clock.